present are all five directors, Director Campbell, Director Whitfield, Director Barnes, Director Johnson. We have Interim Superintendent Dr. Marcy Larson, executive staff and members of our staff as well as members of the community. We also have our student rep, Laura. I want to welcome everyone to tonight's meeting. Members of the public can log into the regular board meeting using the Zoom link on the board docs website. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, moving on to agenda item 2.05, approval of the agenda. I don't see any modifications. Okay, is there any motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda as presented. Second? Second. There's a motion and a second to approve the agenda dated de December 13th, December 12th, 2021. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? <laughs> the agenda item has passed five to zero. Okay, moving on to agenda item 3.01, board reorganization. Okay, so we're just gonna go ahead and go through one, two, three, four, five, and six positions. And it is uh, per board policy 1210, our annual reorganization meeting and elections are to be conducted in the following order. We'll have board president, board vice president, president pro, pro temp, WASDA legislative rep, RWIAA liaison, and the IMC representative. So we'll start with, I will call for nominations for president to serve during the ensuing year. President will, oh, those are instructions. <laughs> okay. I now open nominations for the position of president for the board for the coming year. Okay. So I would like to nominate Jennifer Bumpus to continue as president. I think that Jennifer's done a wonderful job. And I like the idea of consistency of us moving together as a young board. And so, Jen, I have all the confidence in you to continue forward. So I officially would like to nominate you to continue, if you would be so willing. So sweet. <laughs> Are there any other nominations? Okay. Nominations for the position of president are now closed. I will call for a roll call vote for the position of president for Jennifer Bumpus. <laughs> Holly, will you call the roll? Yes. Director Bumpus? Yes. Director Barnes? Yes. Director Campbell? Sure. <laughs> Director Johnson? Yes. Director Whitfield? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. This is the first time I've actually used the gavel, y'all, in a year. So getting used to it. Yeah, getting used to it. Okay, I will call for nominations for vice president to serve during the ensuing year. I now open nominations for the position of vice president of the board for the coming year. I would like to nominate director. Anybody else? Any other nominations? Nominations for the position of vice president are now closed. I will call for a vote for the position of vice president for Director Jeremiah Campbell. Holly, will you call the roll? Yes. President Bumpus? Yes. Director Barnes? Yes. Director Campbell? Okay. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Whitfield? Yes. Congratulations, Jeremiah. You too. I will go ahead and call for nominations for president pro tem to serve during the ensuing year. 
I now open nominations for the position of President Pro Tem of the board for the coming year. I nominate Director Whitfield. Any other nominations? Nominations for the position of President Pro Tem are now closed. I will call for a vote for the position of Pre President Pro Tem for Director Chuck Whitfield. Holly, will you call the roll? Yes. President Bumpus? Yes. Director Barnes? Yes. Director Campbell? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Whitfield? Yes. Congratulations, Director Whitfield. Okay, I will now call for nominations for the WASDA legislative representative to serve during the ensuing year. I now open nominations for the position of WASDA legislative representative of the board for the coming year. I nominate uh, Director Johnson for the position. Any other nominations? Nominations for the position of WASDA legislative rep are now closed. I will call for a vote for the position of WASDA legislative rep for Director Sarah Johnson. Holly, will you call the roll? Yes. President Bumpus? Yes. Director Barnes? Yes. Director Campbell? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes, thank you. Director Whitfield? Yes. Congratulations, Sarah. I will now call for nominations for the WIAA liaison to serve during the ensuing year. I now open nominations for the position of WIAA liaison of the board for the coming year. I nominate Director Molly Barnes for the WIAA liaison position. Any other nomination? Nominations for the position of WIAA liaison are now closed. I will call for a vote for the position of WIAA liaison for Director Molly Barnes. Holly, will you call the roll? President Bumpus? Yes. Director Barnes? Yes. Director Campbell? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Whitfield? Yes. Congratulations, Molly. Okay, we will now call for nominations for the IMC representative to serve during the ensuing year. I now open nominations for the position of IMC representative of the board for the coming year. I nominate Director Whitfield. Any other nominations? Nominations for the position of IMC representative are now closed. I will call for a vote for the position of IMC representative for Director Whitfield. Holly, will you call the roll? Yes. President Bumpus? Yes. Director Barnes? Yes. Director Campbell? Yes. Director Johnson? Yes. Director Whitfield? Yes. Congratulations, Director Whitfield, WIAA. Congratulations, board. Get to do it again. Oh, IMC, excuse me, sorry, IMC rap. <clears throat> so just so the audience knows everyone serves for the year um sarah johnson's director johnson's position is the one that is for two years and so the next time it'll be up will be in or for a vote will be 2024. okay moving on to agenda item 4.01 we have student representatives and we have laura to help highlight some student activities throughout the district Okay, there's not a lot going on at Sky Valley right now, but we do have a fundraiser this Wednesday and it's authentic Thai food. And it's from 1130 to 1245. And so I think it's $5 per bowl of coconut soup, coconut curry, and then $5 per bowl of Thai, Thai fried rice. Is that what it is? Yeah. So that will be very fun. Any questions? Yes, this Wednesday, December 14th. Any questions for Laura? How do, uh, are you taking finals right now? Or are you are you done with finals? Uh, we don't have finals, I don't think. Oh, well, that's science nice. Test. Science yeah. test. How'd you do on your science test? Great. Nice. 
Good job, Brad. <laughs> Laura, I got excited about Thai food and I just completely lost everything because I wanted to write it down. What is the fundraiser for again? Um, it's for the program that I'm in, ACT, okay. Academy, of, Academy of Critical Thinking. Awesome. Thank you, Laura. Okay, moving on to agenda item, agenda item 4.02, we have audience comments. We welcome comments about school board and district decisions, processes, and concerns. I will take a few minutes to remind everyone how this works. Each speaker has three minutes. However, if several are here on the same topic, a representative may be selected for the group and speak for 10 minutes. In doing so, the individuals in that group yield their time to their representative. It is important to note that a separate process exists for concerns about staff. Audience comments during the school board meeting is not the forum for staff complaints. If you are here for that reason, please contact any staff member and they will help you learn more about the staff complaint process. Be aware that if at any time during a speaker's comments, the words begin to approach a personnel concern, I will remind the speaker once to keep comments centered on district or school board decisions, processes, and concerns. If that speaker continues with staff related comments, I will give 30 seconds for the presenter to immediately sum up their thoughts and return to the audience. Again, please contact any staff member to help with how to go forward with a complaint about personnel. It looks like we may have, do we have someone on Zoom? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, so. Go ahead and have Heather come up. And then can I have you state your name and your relationship to the district? Hi, I'm still Heather Young and I still have two kids in the district. Uh, and um, I thought that this would be a good night for us to talk a little bit about um, Chuck's favorite topic, the Open Public Meetings Act. Um, the purpose of the Open Public Meeting Act is to allow the public to observe all steps in the making of government decisions. There are limited narrow exceptions, such as executive session, that afford the board the ability to have private discussions for specific purposes, such as the review of a specific legal concern or an employee performance concern. Passage of formal actions, though, even if discussed in executive session, still have to be adopted through open public meetings in order to be valid. So here we are between election cycles, the levy renewal thankfully successfully behind us, but with much work still to do ahead. And as you consider your next steps on your road to being a board of distinction, I'm asking you to pause and reflect on the use and potential misuse of consent agendas. For those in the community who are unfamiliar, a consent agenda groups a number of items together, allowing the board to streamline approval of those with a single vote without any public discussion. These can be used to speed up a meeting, but they are supposed to be limited to routine, non-controversial items or matters that the board has achieved consensus on through prior public discussion. It's designed to cover routine, self-explanatory, ministerial tasks, such as the approval of the past meeting's minutes, regular reports, or conventional actions covered by policy. Consent agendas do save a lot of time, but they can also be abused very easily, as I think we all witnessed with our prior board. There needs to be very clear restrictions such as having a rule that says that there are no contracts over a certain value of say five thousand dollars is pretty standard any controversial topics or anything with the potential for the appearance of a conflict of interest should not be included now the community has stressed over and over and over again the need for this board to do better with transparency and accountability and more and more people <laughs> inappropriately stuffing the consent agenda will only result in further mistrust so please be very very thoughtful about what you're including on the consent agenda 
and look to have more conversations where everyone can see them. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. We have Reese. Hi, Reese. Can I have Hi. you state your name and your relationship to the school district? My name is Reese Wilson Gorsuch, and I happen to be in the same program as Laura at Sky Valley Education Center. And I'm here to voice my concern about the structure of the school after being in a geology like unit. So, during this geology unit, we watched this PBS video, and during this video, it's been brought to my attention that the brick building that we are in wouldn't really respond well to earthquakes. So I was thinking, how can I fix that problem? And then I realized the evacuation process and evacuating would help greatly. So I also looked into the board docs and public records, and I found the 2008 meeting, which was assessing the, tra the transferring of students to Park Place. And then I also found that during that, seismic upgrades were given to Park Place for 23 million. So I guess I was just wondering, like, why Sky Valley isn't being renovated? And I'm not saying that it has to be renovated. I'm just wondering if it's possible to change it to the evacuation process because of the structure. Because I know that earthquakes, at least the Cascadia quake coming up, is a, is a subjection earthquake, meaning that both two waves would be put out, P waves and S waves. P waves are primary waves. They would hit first, and it would cause a light shaking and it would be noticeable, but it wouldn't, but it wouldn't be like the major sh like shakes. So the pre waves would hit us and would be given approximately a minute before the S waves actually do hit. And in that minute, I believe that we could evacuate everybody out safely. And I guess I'm just here because I'm concerned knowing that I would know to evacuate and leave the building, but I don't think students, other students would because they're being taught to duck and cover, which after doing a bunch of research, I don't think would be the best option. So. I think that's pretty much all I had to say. So. Thank you, Reese. Okay, moving on to agenda item 4.03. We have staff recognition. It is for our employees of the month for November. We'll go ahead and hand it off to Ms. Sarah Johnson, Director Sarah Johnson. So I get to read about Melissa Kachovos. She is the SLC teacher at Salem Woods Elementary. She's here. Oh, she's online. Hi, Melissa. <laughs> Hi, Melissa's mom. <laughs> Melissa balances several roles and has done so in a collaborative, supportive, and caring way for the most vulnerable population of students. She's in her first year in Monroe and has already become an incredible and vital role in the school's overall culture of high standards, equitable access, and caring environment. Thank you so much, Melissa, and thanks to your mom, too. It's my pleasure to read <clears throat> uh, for the Classified Employee of the Month, Loretta Morris. She's a student support advocate in Monroe High School in Frank Wagner Elementary. Come on up. <laughs> oh, we just learners. Okay, it has it down here correctly. Well, let me read the nominations. Uh, Loretta is a new is new in her role this year and has hit the ground running. She has worked tirelessly to support families with basic needs. She has left no stone unturned when looking for solutions to help students feel safe and cared for. Loretta has been an asset to me as I am learning how to navigate the school, the support roles at the school. She has been patient and kind with the students, and she has had a positive attitude with running into obstacles. Second nomination says, for being new at her role, 
role and having both leaders in learning and the high school and for taking on all the challenges with a smile and a positive attitude. And Loretta is such an amazing um, addition to our education team that she has multiple other nominations as well. So I get the honor of reading nomination and leadership. Loretta is an amazing advocate for students in our district that often live in very vulnerable circumstances. She is creative in her thinking when supporting a student as there are often many barriers to overcome. Loretta draws the whole family into her scope when possible and creates relationships that only help support having successful outcomes for the students. Loretta, there's four nominations for you because you're amazing. So I'm gonna read your fourth one. It's been really awesome to read about what your colleagues have to say about what you've done. Thank you for what you do for our district. Nomination number four says Loretta began <clears throat> her job a few weeks after the school year started and hit the ground running. Loretta is skilled at learning quickly what students and families need and has a very short and, and has in a very short time helped erase barriers to student success, all while all while learning the job and the dynamics of the new the new position brings. On top of that, she bring, she has been a valuable team player. Uh, in the BHT unit and is encouraging others with, with positive affirmations and support. Loretta's big heart for kids is so obvious to see within minutes of meeting her. Thank you for loving our families and our students. I have Administrator of the Month. I had to pay big bucks for this one to be able to read it. Ms. Principal Jeff Presley, can you come up, please? <laughs> Mr. Presley, principal at Frylands Elementary School. Mr. Presley's nomination reflects an admin who positively impacts the people around him. He takes tangible steps to move his Freilands family forward in a positive direction daily. Over the past few months, I have enjoyed watching him on Good Morning Fry Good Morning Freilands. I appreciate Mr. Presley's time to acknowledge. <clears throat> Excuse me. <sighs> Hispanic Heritage Month, Diwali, Dia de los Muertos, Veterans Day, and Native American Heritage Month, to name a few. I appreciate him using his platform to help educate and engage everyone at school. Sorry. <laughs> and in the community by spreading multicultural awareness. His passion and enthusiasm are contagious. Thank you. Mr. Presley, we appreciate you. And as a parent with kids in this school, you've been amazing. My kids love you so much. And I know that it's not just my kids, it's the entire Freilands or Falcons family. You are instrumental in being a positive light bringing source at that school and I um, I'm, have seen you through the past two and a half years and I am you have encouraged and motivated me uh, personally even in this position in this capacity and as a parent who, with children at the school and uh, I just want to say personally thank you for everything that you do and uh, you are supremely appreciated Mr. Presley thank you I have a certificate. I'm sorry, I don't cry, Mr. Press. I'm still crying.
Holy moly. I'm sorry, you guys. We just really love Mr. Presley at our home. <laughs> okay. Moving on to agenda item 5.01, we have the HYA Hazard Young ATEA and Associates presentation. They will provide an overview of the superintendent's search. Chris. Good evening. It's such a pleasure to be here with you again this evening. Um, we're always on the agenda following that wonderful tribute to your, your staff. So um, it's, it is moving and I'm just thrilled that you take time out of your uh, meetings to recognize your wonderful staff. Uh, John and I are honored to be here tonight to share with you a culmination of a lot of listening and learning over the last several months, and that is called the Leadership Profile Report. And we also would like to touch on preparation for interviews uh, briefly tonight, and we get the pleasure of assigning you some homework, so stay tuned on that. <laughs> um, to begin with, uh, the handout I think is coming around of uh, the Leadership Profile Report, and we wanted to just again hit a few high spots we're not going to go through line by line uh, we want you to have a chance to really sit with it and um, and glean what you will um, from our professional um, opinions and um, our summaries from the last several months so we wanted to mention for all that this is a reminder that the engagement phase of the search process um, has just wrapped up as of last Wednesday. However, uh, John and I are going to continue to listen and learn up through your final decision. So um, if there are other uh, community members, constituents that we have not had a chance to, to hear from, um, there's still time. Um, but this is a milestone tonight to present this report to you. We have been um, engaged in um, small group forums. We've engaged with uh, two large community forum opportunities, individual interviews, and the thought exchange. We also went back and took the opportunity to review your thought exchange uh, from last spring, even, to really hear what your community was saying. And that was really beneficial. Um, wanted to mention that there were three questions asked of all of the groups or the individuals that we met with and that was essentially you know what are the strengths of the districts what's going well what's working well what are you most proud of and it was heartwarming to hear um, the feedback on that and we'll get to that in just a moment um, we also asked them to share what the challenges were for the district the greatest challenges and um, we certainly learned a lot through that question as well. And the third question was, what characteristics, attributes are you looking for in the next superintendent? So that became, um, those three components were critical um, parts of this final report. So John's gonna take it away with uh, participation data. Thank you, Chris. Um, wanna share with you that we generally aim for roughly 10% of the student population for participation. And in talking with Aaron, um, there's a similar standard here in Monroe for communications and surveys and the like. So I'm pleased to report after we've crunched numbers and tried to eliminate duplicated counts that we had 610 individual participants in the engagement phase. That includes the thought exchange, individual interviews, and our group listening sessions that we held. There were a total of 35 uh, separate sessions that were offered that included uh, two open community forums that we offered to the community um, as part of this process. Uh, the thought exchange was open uh, in November from the 10th through the 23rd and um, quite a chunk of that total participant number was in the thought exchange. And so we're uh, really grateful to the communications team Aaron and Tamara for uh, getting that up as 
quickly as they could once we launched the search. Um, and that was extremely valuable, um, the results of that in helping us confirm many of the themes that we heard when we met with people. Um, we also wanna share with you that um, as you forecasted last summer when we first began with you, uh, we should count on some folks with some strong feelings on a variety of topics and we absolutely heard that. Some of the listening sessions were just a whole lot of listening and, um, and we know that's something that you value as a board and we value as a search firm and we know better informs your decision on the next superintendent. And as Chris mentioned, all this information, then uh, we're tasked with distilling that down for you and what we're presenting tonight. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it back to Chris and she's gonna dump, jump in on the strongest themes we heard regarding strengths of the district right now. Yeah, again, um, there were many, many shared and there is just a real pride um, in this community and um, heartfelt feelings um, throughout all of the listening that we did. And as I mentioned, I mean, we took notes in all of those 35 sessions um, and we then distilled what were those common threads, the common themes. Um, and these three really emerged very clearly. The first being a caring and engaged community um, and should be proud of that. Um, describing the community as supportive and actively engaged, that there's a real hope and optimism uh, regarding the future of the district, uh, which is wonderful. The second one is dedicated staff. That just emerged over and over. Um, strong building level um, staff that care deeply for each and every child. Um, their strength, passion, and resiliency was consistently cited. Um, so a real love for your local schools, for sure. <laughs> there was also a, a common theme of, of appreciation for your school level leaders that they were really cited as uh, being able to um, help the district through the last several challenging years. Um, their, their stability um, was really needed during some rough, challenging times. So uh, uh, congratulations to the district leaders, or excuse me, the, the school level leaders as well. Um, the next was about educational options, um, a real, uh, pride in the options that students and families have in this community, um, that your support as a school board to provide that range of options um, is evident and appreciated. There's an enthusiasm for these programs and a hope that the district will continue uh, to support these moving forward. And the next is um, about turning the corner. Um, we tried to figure out a name for this section, <laughs> but that's where we landed. Um, you know, a sense of, of we've been through challenging times, but we're starting to see some glimmers of real hope and change and improvement, um, which was really encouraging. Again, the challenges facing the district were abundantly clear, but it was really nice to see also um, this sense of optimism for the future and let's continue to build on this momentum. All right, jumping into challenges, um, turning the corner is a nice segue because um, I'm about to get into the challenges and you know, one of the most, one of the strongest themes I think was one that we also heard this past summer in um, I guess the shorter version of engagement that we did, but it, it remains, but we did hear a little different message about the um, challenges around increasing diversity in the community and the district and some issues the district has had in recent uh, months uh, regarding that. Um, and closely tied to that as we get into the qualities and characteristics people want uh, is, are those qualities that folks believe strongly will help continue uh, turning the corner for Monroe. Among the challenges uh, folks really wanna see 
continue to change is more consistency and accountability in addressing incidents of racism, homophobia, discrimination, harassment, and bullying at each school. And I'll call out the consistency part of that because we did hear parents mention that, uh, especially if they had multiple children in the system, that they do see some differences across schools and how those things are managed or not. Um, and how they're re and the response, I guess, of each school uh, with regard to those things. So folks are really uh, prioritizing that as a task moving forward for obviously you all and the next superintendent. Um, we also confirmed, as uh, we learned this summer, that there are um, opposing views that mirror largely what you hear in the political environment, not only locally, but regionally and nationally around how the district should or should not be approaching issues of diversity and their work with students. Um, and while there was certainly some extreme opinion shared um, that again mirror that political rhetoric, um, we found that there was strong support and strong commonality among people that uh, they believe every student uh, deserves to be seen, and this was a statement in the thought exchange, to be seen, heard, valued, and safe, regardless of their needs, differences, or backgrounds. There's a lot of support for that, and it suggests that the pathway forward to continue moving to a more unified place is to stay focused on that as the fundamental purpose of a public school system. And so, um, I leave you to reflect on that because as we decide how we're going to go about screening candidates, um, that one likely will be front and center in terms of what we're looking for and what you're looking for. Um, we also, uh, again, I mentioned related to that was trust, communication, and transparency, and we called out that category. Um, and I do want to mention that the thought exchange results are on the website. and. Um, Thank you to Erin for getting that posted. Tonight she told me it's in multiple places, but if you go to the superintendent search page, um, she described a big blue button and sure enough, it, it's there. So if you wanna go and see all the thoughts and how they were rated, you can go, um, and for the public here tonight and tuning in, you, anybody can go there and take a closer look. Um, and so we folded that obviously into these strong themes. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that category because we're gonna get into that as we uh, talk about qualities and characteristics. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. So when we're talking about the areas and how things were ranked, is there another way to do that based on the most rated one with the highest rating instead of just taking the one that has the highest rating that might say has 20 ratings, but you have another one that has 76 that's somewhat below that. Is there another way to get that information based on how many stars, how many ratings it has, not just the overall total number of stars, like the most people who rated it. Does that make sense? Regardless of how they rated it. Regardless of how they rated it, the, the most that were rated and then kind of put them in order based on there. Is there a way to get to get that? I am newer to thought yeah, extreme, the, the, so the hottest new. The hottest topics, the most rated topics, and then put them in order based on their stars. So take the, um, you know, take the one that has 76 and where does it fall? Okay, if there's one that has 72, where does that one fall? Kind of, does that make sense? Am I making sense? Okay. Yeah, I, sorry to put you on the spot, Erin, but she's our thought exchange partner, so. So are you just wanting to know the most controversial topics? Because if somebody could have rated a thought a one, which means they disagree, or they somebody could have rated it a five. So. If you're counting all the ratings, you're not getting what's most important to people. Does that make sense? Right. I'm looking at the so I'm looking at the highest ratings, but also has the highest number of uh, people who chimed in on it. So if there were if there was a 4.5 that had 76 people on it, I want to know about that one. I want to know the highest ratings with the highest amount of people. So that would be it is ranked. That is. The ranking in there if you go into all the thoughts you can see number um, one has 26 people that chimed in on it and so 26. it has 26 and then the next one has 76 and it's sort of so it's averaging the star rating right so, and i want it the star rating based on let's look at the the amount of people that chimed in i want the most amount of people that chimed in and then give me the highest star rating 
Okay. I'll that look makes... into that. Okay. Yeah. I don't know that that's something that they report on, but I can definitely ask that question. Okay. Thanks. It's a great question. Thank you for the data question. And I'm seeing what you're looking at here right now. So the number in parentheses indicates the number of people next to each of those start items. Okay. All right. Um, moving on, uh, a theme not quite as strong, but certainly we heard this uh, from a majority of internal folks, staff, particularly school and district leaders. That, um, there's a lot of pride taken in a number of initiatives that are currently underway and people really working hard on things. But what we heard was the need to coordinate those independent efforts uh, and capitalize on uh, how those things can contribute to a system-wide focus. The word strategic plan was sometimes mentioned in this regard. Some people simply describe the need for maybe some annual district goal setting. Um, you already, and tonight you heard um, that there's a school improvement planning structure already in place here. So um, I think you have the pieces um, for a great start toward um, some sort of system-wide process where you would establish a clear and uh, focused effort then that where all the boats, some people said this, we, we need all the boats rowing in the same direction. And, um, and so that's a phrase we heard from more than one group, more than one individual as we were visiting. And that's really the essence of that theme. And then finally, we heard some uh, concerns around facilities. Uh, you heard from a student tonight around Sky Valley. That's a facility we heard about multiple times regarding its needs, but not the only facility we heard about leaky roofs that need to be addressed. We learned about HVAC systems in more than one place that need attention. Um, and yes, we heard about the district office lease and concerns that some people have over that. Um, and so we included that in the report just to acknowledge that that's um, in this theme called facility um, planning uh, and decision making. And so folks are wanting uh, more transparency and in terms of how the district goes about prioritizing um, available money for facility improvements and repairs. And then they're interested in that long range process, a capital facilities planning process. And then a sub theme to that, we heard from some folks that you identified for us to reach out to was um, the youth athletics community. Uh, several of them shared a concern around um, the current process for requesting to use district athletic facilities. And I see some of you nodding, so I won't go into great detail here, but they feel like it's more cumbersome than it needs to be, that doesn't prioritize local youth over neighboring uh, sports teams and communities that they see using the facility. Sometimes they're not youth groups either. And um, we did hear understanding from those groups that it does, uh, there is a price tag to maintaining those facilities. So they, it's not that they're opposed to fees, but they would welcome the opportunity to be part of a, a review of current policy and procedure and fees around those things. I'll stop there. And the third question, as we mentioned, gets at desired characteristics. So what are um, those characteristics, attributes, skills, experiences that um, your community, your staff, your students um, would like to see in the next superintendent. While we typically like to keep this section to about four or six max, we, we could not <laughs> in this case. So we thought we'd err on the side of being um, a, a, a little more inclusive here, and we have 10. So I'm just going to name those. You can see that there are sub bullets under each one that goes into further detail about the common words used to describe um, these attributes and characteristics. Um, but again, just um, for the audience as well, first and foremost, moral character, compassionate and caring, committed to inclusive culture and schools, communication and relational skills, high expectations for student behavior, experienced leader, fosters team culture, engaged in schools and the community, and strategic focus. So that high expectations for student behavior kind of got 
split on those pages. Sorry about that. Um, so again, this is, becomes a really important document as we move forward together, both in the interview questions that you select, um, in the screening that we do. Um, we have a document then that we can send out to all of the prospective uh, candidates, and they use that um, to address uh, how they believe their skills and abilities align with your, your greatest needs. And so um, this document um, will be shared immediately <laughs> after tonight. We have, a, as you know, um, a list of folks who are waiting, waiting, and are eager to submit their final applications. So we're excited to get this to them. And with that, um, I already mentioned your communications team. I want to call out Holly as well and Marcy for their time in being thought partners, um, Holly especially just for the background support, including tonight with copies. And um, I can't tell you how many times I've been offered a bottle of water. She is on it um, and we love her. So um, anyway, uh, you have a great team here to work with and we've been blessed to benefit from that. And we really look forward to this next phase in our process, which we do call the select phase. And so, um, okay to segue here to... Yeah, I was going to mention Jesse okay. too. He All was right. uh, listed in that paragraph, but uh, we wanted to call out Jesse. Uh, great support for all of our Zoom meetings, uh, our forums, et cetera. So thank you, Jesse. All right. Jesse has special candy he'll share with you too if you ask nicely. <laughs> So we are going to transition, unless you have any comments, questions um, about the leadership profile report. I do want to know how you um, are going to find the perfect human being who also happens to be an accomplished veteran superintendent. Yes, and they leap tall buildings yes. in, a, <laughs> in a single That bound. seems to be in the list as well. This <laughs> right. is a, a tall order, but I appreciate, I know that you guys have done, I just want to make a comment, um, joking aside. This is a lot of information that you guys have put down into very concise, and I appreciate the work that you have done in the past, uh, finding Dr. Larson and the work that went into that, the work that you're doing now, and, and uh, that you are continuing to do, and we really do appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you for the work that, all that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. So this uh, gets you thinking about the next phase. Um, as John mentioned, which is the select phase. And um, we're excited to talk about the details of that. Um, tonight, we're just gonna give you the high level overview. We get together again on January 9th, which is when we will present the slate of completed applications, talk those through with you. We will be finalizing um, interview uh, components and so we'll talk more about your homework in just a moment the packets that are coming around there are two the first one is an overview called interviewing protocols and guidelines and this will be um, again just for your reading between now and the ninth would be really helpful and I just want to highlight what's in your packet um, and again for the audience to know as well just an introduction about you know, interviewing. Some of you are very <laughs> experienced uh, in this area and some may not as part of their um, prior work. So we just wanna remind people and be sure that we're grounded in the same guidelines, right? Because different districts and different companies do it very differently. So we wanna make sure we're all on the same page as we approach this really important next phase. So again, it talks about um, you know, how important is the interview even in the total grand scheme of things? It's a critical component, but it's only one of like five, right? So kind of keeping in mind as we move to this next phase, um, how we approach welcoming candidates into the community even, you remember that they're interviewing you as much as you're interviewing them. And so creating that culture of warmth and welcome and um, 
being sure that all of their needs are met and their questions are answered um, is going to be important as we as we move forward. Um, a few notes about interviewing protocols. We wanted to put in the federal guidelines about what's a legal and illegal question. <laughs> so these are permissible and impermissible um, by law so that we don't get tripped up anywhere and uh, get into any hot, hot water. So those are the charts around the law. <laughs> There's a side story, or is there a question? <laughs> no, okay. We won't get into the side story either. Um, and the final com component in your packet that we would really encourage you to read before the ninth is about bias in the hiring process. Um, there are, you know, college level courses you could take in this topic, and and it wouldn't it be nice if we all had a chance to do that. What John and I thought we'd do is at least give you um, just a, a really good reminder overview from the Harvard Business Review, seven practical ways to reduce bias in your hiring practices. So it's just a good read and a good reference for you. So there's some homework to get us ready for our discussion on the ninth. And John will take it away on your interview questions homework. Yeah, so before I segue to that, um, the bias resource that Chris just mentioned, that you've trusted us to help you with the leg of this process. And we want you to know we're deeply, both of us are deeply committed, as is our company, to encouraging and cultivating processes that provide not just access, but encourage candidates who are underrepresented in leadership positions in public schools to make application. We provide complimentary coaching to those folks, feedback on resume building, those kinds of things. Certainly when they get into the screening process, we make sure that that's um, an equitable process as well. But um, we are proud of the track record we have in recent years in populating candidate pools with a rich diversity and that's our goal here as well um, as we started recruiting right out of the gate um, that's been top of mind as we do this work so know that we're committed to that not just by handing you out an article all right it's part of how we roll um, the homework task should look familiar but i do want to uh, share with you that um, we updated uh, several of the questions based on the leadership profile we just presented. And again, I'm not going to go through all that. Um, you can take a look at it. So yes, you'll notice some we didn't change because there, I think there's still some um, really solid questions in there that fall into multiple domains. You'll see that we added some questions around the facilities issue that you might want to consider. But we are asking you to individually do this task. And then like we did for the interim search, we'll uh, synthesize your individual prioritization and show you what your group result looks like and then finalize that with you so we're ready for semi-finalist interviews. Any questions about the task? I should bring up the due date. Good teachers do that. Um, January 2nd, please, um, by the end of the day. I will email this to you as well because I know some of you prefer the electronic method, so watch for that either tonight or tomorrow. And then just uh, we'll conclude with just again a preview of our work in January. So we have the meeting on the 9th, as we mentioned, and then the semi-finalist interviews on the 20th. If you'll continue to hold the whole day, we will have a, a schedule proposed uh, for you when we meet on the 9th. And then finally, um, the 26th, again, all day, um, you may be um, just included in the evening section, but we'll talk that through on the ninth as well. So uh, we're looking forward to working with you um, as we move forward. So thank you all so much for the opportunity. Any further questions? I do have one question, um, and I'm looking at the um, sort of event calendar on the Monroe School District website, um, and I'm. I'm interested in knowing more about how we're going to make sure the community knows how they can participate, um, you know, what platforms they have available to them, how they can get in touch, because I don't see that on here currently. Yes, we 
just had a meeting um, three hours ago about uh, some of those logistics. Um, these are really in draft form and we need you to weigh in and approve these drafts. So we're going to um, talk with you, Sarah and Jennifer, on Wednesday in our check-in meeting to show you these initial drafts and then we'll get the rest out to the rest of the board. Um, we'll ask you to finalize all of those schedules on the night and then the communications team, Dr. Larson, they're all ready to, um, to really blast it out right after the ninth about all the details. Yeah, I would just add that the direction we heard from the board is you want um, opportunities for community engagement at the finalist phase of this process. So the ideas that we're gonna bring forward to you are one way uh, to accomplish that, that we've seen work pretty effectively in other searches. It doesn't mean you have to just rubber stamp it. If you want us to tweak things here and there, we will listen and customize it to make sure it fits for all of you. But um, we feel good about the conversation we had today because your staff knows your district pretty well. And, um, and some of it's just logistics. Do we have a large enough space to do this kind of an activity here and there? If we're gonna feed people, what's that look like? It, so some of that is planning with your staff, uh, but we're confident um, we can pull off um, ample opportunity for folks to be involved, including like you do with your board meetings, uh, folks who don't want to come in person, able to tune in and at least weigh in with their feedback. So coming attractions, thank you for the question. Yeah. We'll be collecting feedback throughout the whole day. Every session um, we'll be gathering the feedback that you can take a look at live even as the day goes on. So more to come on those details, but thank you for the question. Thank you for your support. We look forward to working with you. Thank you, Chris and John. Okay, and moving on to agenda item 5.02, professional learning and development part three. And we have Kim Whitworth and Dean, Deanne Hermes with the learning and teaching department. This is part three of the learning and teaching department's report to the board. The first two parts, the first two reports covered our student achievement data and the actions we are taking in schools in response to that data. This third part will highlight the professional development we are offering to support the continuous improvement of our schools. Thank you. So this is part three. Part three is professional learning and development of staff and service to student achievement. Part one was general smart or balance assessment and Washington comprehensive assessment of science outcomes. And part two is when you heard the principals come in and talk about what actions they're taking in their schools and what they're doing to improve outcomes for all of our kids. In the spring, we had several task forces in place who reviewed data and needs to determine what our summer professional development was going to look like. Of the many critical components to professional development, I'd like to highlight the state guidance. Phrases that stood out were job embedded, sustained evidence-based strategies, established collaborative teams, working together on an ongoing basis, assisting all students in meeting state academic learning standards, advance ongoing school-based professional learning that occurs throughout the year. And there is a link on that slide um, to the full RCW if you're interested. So um, professional learning communities were a perfect solution. As a district, we'd been using the solution tree PLCs at work model in varying degrees and pockets, but it became very clear that we needed this work as a foundation for everything we do. We also looked at state guidance which was released in March for our CCDEI professional development. In this first year, we decided to focus on standard number one, understanding self and others. We selected Courageous Conversation to present this professional development. We looked at the importance of the through line between administrative professional development and certificated PD. And so this summer learning was set up with the following five goals. One, provide to all admin and certificated staff foundational understanding of district, building, and collaborative teamwork in the PLC process. 
Two, provide learning structures to establish a district guiding coalition. Three, provide learning structures, structures to establish guiding coalitions at all buildings. Four, using the cycle of inquiry, develop departmental and building goals for multilingual learners. And five, provide learning opportunities for staff to understand themselves as diverse cultural beings and provide tools to have these courageous conversations with others. Kim is now going to share feedback on our summer learning and our next steps. We always get feedback from the professional development we provide so that we can continue to get better at serving staff. While the feedback was overwhelmingly positive, we also pay close attention to staff for whom the professional development did not fit their needs. All of this data will be used to plan our future work together. Our administrators appreciated that we have narrowed our focus in providing the PLC learning we need as a system to continue to learn and improve together. What, I'm, what we highlighted here are some of the statements that they gave us. Staff understands the need to improve how we serve our multilingual learners. While they appreciated the presentation from Chris Cronus, they are asking for more opportunities to learn MLL strategies. And again, here are some statements that staff made in regard to that professional learning. The feedback from staff regarding courageous conversations was very positive. We have heard from a number of staff that this training provided them an insight into their students and colleagues experiences that they were not completely aware of. They want to learn more to ensure we have a safe and productive learning and working environment. We included in this uh, a link to a summary that we tried to put together and also the raw data that we took from the survey. And there are links there if you would like to, to follow that and see the complete survey results. Again, there are four statements from staff regarding the professional development. There is a clear desire from our colleagues to strengthen our professional learning community, so we will continuously improve to meet the needs of every single student who crosses the threshold of our doors. The District Guiding Coalition continues to meet once a month to learn and develop our system for collaboration and continuous improvement. We are putting together some synchronous and asynchronous learning opportunities focused on English language development strategies. As a system, we are still in the process of determining the next steps for future CCDEI learning, and that's cultural competency, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have amazing administrators and staff in Monroe, and we would now like to share the MSD learning story of the past six months through their voices. And this week we spent the week learning with all of our school building leaders as well as all of our central office leaders and really talked about the importance of working within collaborative teams and working together to identify problems of practice and areas of focus and the power of doing that as a team rather that, than as individuals. Yes, and I think one of my biggest takeaways is just and reflections is how um, the district office and our team in particular can be of service to the other teams, how we can play our part in helping the building teams, the teaching teams reach their goals for their students. I think my takeaway is just uh, a lot of hope looking ahead being in Monroe for over 20 years. Um, we've been trying to do this work in pockets and it's been really challenging. And I think the fact that as a district, we're moving forward together is gonna help us actually achieve our goals and meeting the needs of all of our kids. And having all students learning at a high level and that, that feels really good after a couple of challenging years. So I've uh, this week I've learned so far the importance of breaking down silos and uh, the positive impact that can have on uh, transportation and uh, the opportunities that would present itself to collaborating with everyone else in the district. And I'm committed to taking a look at that and how a PLC 
but in transportation could really have really profound impact as far as student management. I loved seeing how um, people working together can do so much more than somebody working alone. Nobody has the energy or all the information to make decisions on their own. Um, I love learning more about the power of collaboration and working together. Ways this week has been about how our professional learning communities um, don't just start and stop in the building and at the classroom level, but involve our entire buildings working together, um, multiple buildings working together, and the district as a whole, and how important that is to reach our goals as a district. Um, PLC and Guiding Coalition. I've been a fan of PLCs. Um, as far as the individual PLC I'm involved with, it's a great place for us to get together figure out what we're going to do together and be on track with the same uh, key essential standards that we're measuring and teaching. And we don't have to do all the work ourselves, we spread it out and we just build things together and it works out great. So I'm a PLC fan. Here at Maltby we're at the beginning stages of creating norms, goals that are based off of the data that we've collected on our students and establishing common formative assessment. Our last unit assessment for sixth graders on racism and proportions, we are looking at um, testing them on, what do we say, equivalent ratio tables, ratio tables, correct? Okay, so we need to build our assessment, which I think if we take a look at our planning calendar, so part of what we're doing when we're selecting problems is we do the problems ourselves so we could figure out where the kids might get stumped. This week, the elementary administrator spent time learning more about the PLC process and collaborating around the cycle of inquiry. One of our takeaways was the importance of establishing a through line from our work at the Guiding uh, District Coalition to a Building Guiding Coalition. Because of this, we are committing to establishing a guiding coalition within all of our buildings at the beginning of the year. Another important takeaway we had was the importance of establishing protocols and structures for our collaborative teams. We commit to providing the time and support that teams need to establish their structures and protocols. We're looking forward to a great year and starting our guiding coalitions this year. Um, to a great uh, so at Chain Lake this year, we are really pleased with how our guiding coalition, our building guiding coalition has been set up. We decided at the beginning of the year that meeting more consistently for shorter amounts of time would really help us keep the momentum and plan and be responsive to what our building needed. So we meet every Thursday morning for just half an hour uh, and we have a representative from every grade level team as well as our um, MLL lab teacher and our resource teacher. And we meet as a group and we sort of structured our meetings that we flip flop every other week. So building directed Fridays are typically every other week. And the Thursday after the building directed Friday, we spend the bulk of our meeting sharing out what teams did at that last building directed collaborative team time. Um, and then we start to plan for the following week, which will again be building directed. Then that second week where there wasn't a building directed Friday beforehand, we really finalize our plans and talk about what teams need. And I will say those Thursday morning meetings are um, short, but the discussion is really rich and really focused on the work. And we've created this predictable pattern, both for the guiding coalition, but also for our staff, because every building directed Friday, we have set up in a way that we come together as a staff for 20 to 30 minutes and do some sort of small piece that we talk about together in terms of the work, whether it's talking about SMART goals, whether it's talking about common formative assessment alignment or something along those lines. And then we send teams to have a good solid hour to work as a collaborative team and really engage and do the work. So we're not necessarily working on SMART goals, we're doing the pre-alignment to get to where we could eventually be there and just working together. Because I went and investigated and they are all over the map from like some are like a simple sentence, some are spelling out the whole standard, so I'm wanting clarification. But the one cool thing about the way they did do it now with the, um, the standards on the website is that you can see the progression. Um, I haven't looked at Wait, writing. Can you show that? Because I didn't have a yeah. that. So the benefit I find for Guiding Coalition is that it's been the missing link between the district office and the teachers. 
So now we feel that we're on the same page and we're all working toward the same goal instead of each of us having a different focus. The guiding coalition that I'm on, I'm finding it um, interesting because it's allowing us to get the whole school together on PLC methods, I guess. And it's there to not only help give some guidance to it, but also support. And I'm looking forward to what we're doing in the future with it as we're identifying some processes to help out students um, with interventions to help them. I've been in Monroe for 22 years and I have to say that the Courageous Conversations PD was the best that I have had in all of those years. I believe that we need as a system tools to have these difficult conversations that we have historically avoided because they are uh, full of fear or discomfort and uncomfortable to have with others. So I have been with the district for over 20 years and the professional development we had this past summer was the first of this kind that I've ever experienced. Um, I greatly appreciate the school board funding Courageous Conversations. Um, it was such a, an emotional experience, an eye-opening experience, and one where myself and other colleagues um, had great conversations afterwards, um, and it was a great starting place for us. And I, again, want to thank the school board for funding this, and um, I hope, plead, that they continue to do so because it's so important for our school district. And when it comes to um, our training last summer, right before school started, with Courageous Conversation, what I would like to say is that our trainer, our facilitator, Julia Berry, was amazing. And I say that in that I came into that training pretty hesitant, um, semi-skeptical. It's a really tough topic around the country, but she was able to create this safe space. Um, she was um, at a place where she could gently invite us into thinking about what our upbringing was, allowed us to seriously listen to others, and just thoughtfully invited us into a courageous conversation about this topic so that our district can really move forward. Uh, courageous Converse Conversations training provided us with an opportunity to share and learn uh, with open hearts. It was so incredibly powerful to sit together as a large collective group and to feel trust, vulnerability, and respect while discussing racial identity, each other's lived experiences, and privilege. This training also identified a very clear urgency for continued work in this area. This learning gave me valuable awareness, tools, and courage to have important conversations about race. Most importantly, the training gave me an opportunity to understand how and why my students need to be seen and what it really means for me as a teacher to create a safe and welcoming place for my students, not only in my classroom, but also in our schools. Thanks to the opportunity to participate in this training, I now feel I have some tools for supporting students and facilitating the conversations about race in my classroom. And I'm also very much looking forward to continued professional development in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I'm just very grateful that I was able to participate in the Courageous Conversation training that we had in August. As an educator of color, it was very um, apparent to me after doing the training how isolated some of our populations of students must feel here in Monroe. And I think it's important that um, I do my best now to help every student feel that they belong in Monroe and Courageous Conversation is a way for me to help my students feel a sense of belonging. And I want to just say, when I first heard about this training, I was really nervous. I was afraid that I was going to get told how to think, how to act, how to behave, or I might be let go or disciplined. But the event was really eye-opening for me as I saw my own life through the lens of privilege. It has softened my approach and increased my desire and ability to help students recognize the diversity around them and learn about from each other. Uh, it's made me aware even more than before of 
what students might be bringing from home or other areas with them each day and how to relate to them through their struggles while helping them be their own best selves. As an extra, it's expanded my views and outlooks which regards to uh, my personal and professional relationships. I could see and express different thoughts when challenging discussions happen about equity and diversity and I feel like a better representation of the person I am called to be. From Courageous Conversations is that we had staff members that never share, share their journey as a person of color um, and as a member of our staff and the most eye-opening is when Someone said to us, I hope this year is more tolerable because my coworkers understand me better. Um, I never thought that that person would have felt that way. So learning something that meaningful made me really think more about my students that have to feel that way. Um, I think it's been great because we're willing to have more conversations than ever before, but we definitely have a long way to go still and need more training to help us get farther along. And after the Courageous Conversation training that we did in August, I felt a whole bunch of emotions. The first emotion I felt was just this weight that I didn't realize I carried that other people carry that's heavier than mine. And being able to connect with friends of mine that are a different race than myself and being able to actually start to have conversations about it really opened my eyes. One of my friends that I've known since the third grade answered all these questions way different than me that I had no idea she was gonna answer in that way. So it was really heavy at first, but then afterwards, we were left with the, the compass, and the compass of either feeling, thinking, or action. And after feeling that heavy weight, I now feel like I've now moved into the thinking portion where, okay, I feel this way, but now it's time to think about what I can do to change, and how, I, how can I help this with my students that I see every day. And then as that thinking process starts, I now also want to jump into action. Okay, well, what can I do tomorrow to make a difference, to make it more equitable for all students? How can I make the music room a place that every person feels welcome, no matter their age, what they look like, or where they come from? What can I do today, even if it's small, because baby steps build success? Um, my takeaways from this week of learning are both the CCDI work and our PLC work are closely tied um, in that being culturally responsive and the work of becoming a district-wide PLC are one and the same. In both situations, there needs to be deep listening, hear all voices, and understand backgrounds in order to build strong, trusting relationships to move forward for the betterment of our students and our community. A lot of learning, uh, we've done a lot of unlearning, um, and some relearning. And we know that the strength of our community, whether that's an individual building, or this district, the strength of this district is that we know that we have amazing educators, we have amazing administrators, we have phenomenal students, and we know that if we work together, which is the strength of our community, that we are going to have students learn more. So as a learning organization, kids are learning, So that concludes our presentation. Um, do you all have questions for us? I had a question on this, what was it? Slide 12, your CCDEI district partnership committee. Who makes up this committee? Was this, is this a committee of just school leaders, school teachers, members of the community? At this time, it's still part of our WASLA work. So it's Dr. Kenoshida from the Washington Association of School Leaders and um, Robin Hayashi and Tara and Andrea, Andrea Payne, you, our, me, our teachers, Chris, yeah. Brett. And Brett and Jeff Presley. Yes. I think that's all. So we have we have district representation. We have building administrators, and we have um, teachers. And that was our commitment to our partnership in the spring was that we would have that partnership with MEA, um, as well as WASLA, um, and the district moving forward. Thank you for putting that video together. It was so cool to see everybody. Um, and it's, I felt really excited because I, I'm pretty sure I can name every single one of those people. And that's, that's new for me. I'm like just a year into this role. Um, and so it was really exciting to see folks from, you know, my family's homeschool, but 
um, I really am feeling more connected to our entire Monroe School District family. And, and so I thank you for that. And for um, I appreciate uh, all of the work that everybody put into that. I, I went in and um, clicked both those links and read through the summary and all of the raw data as well. And I just wanna thank everybody for being generous with their feedback and with their experiences. I think um, especially for difficult topics that can be really hard to provide um, or to offer up um, sincere feedback about what you've been through. And I, and I really got the sense that people um, stretched themselves and were willing to give that information. So I just wanna thank everybody who participated in that. Something that sort of stuck out to me um, as a theme in that feedback um, was that, and, and as somebody who's participated in these kinds of trainings, the hardest thing for me, and, and this is consistent across most of every training of this style that I've been through, is you've got those four agreements, right? And one of them is the expect and accept a lack of closure. And that has always been the hardest one for me to manage. Um, and continues to be so and working on it. And I really felt like from the um, feedback that was provided, um, I felt like I could sense that, sense that from other people. There was a lot of feedback about wanting to do more. There was feedback about feeling like we started these conversations but then didn't receive the tools. And so for me, as I was looking at this whole report, I think that PLCs are really taking off in this district and people are really engaged in them and that that has set up an expectation for collaboration and engagement. And that that is sometimes separate from these sort of isolated trainings or professional development events that we set up. And I, I am hopeful that we can um, continue both. And I think that there is, I hope that there is an opportunity within the district to expand our capacity to make room for that collaboration of the CCDEI work. That it isn't just outside folks coming in and providing information and awareness, which is really important, but that there are also spaces um, that are created and nurtured that allow us as an organization to do that work together. I think for us as a board, um, probably one of the most important things that we can do is keep this in mind as we move through our superintendent search process. I think, um, you know, we had the opportunity to um, vote on funding the Courageous Conversations um, professional development, but I think that our um, even bigger and for me more important role is to find somebody who can continue to lead our district on this path and who can help us prioritize resources into um, this change that I think our district needs and that I think the feedback demonstrates our um, district is is ready for and wanting so thank you and I, I just want to comment briefly on um, what's happening next in terms of this. Systemically, we're still having this conversation. We're tr trying to understand how can we continue this without substitutes and without time. And is this a once a time thing in August? That doesn't mean the work isn't continuing. We have staff across the district who are doing book studies. We have staff that have um, uh, race and equity teams. We have staff that are still continuing to come together to look at data. All of our school leaders and all of our teachers use their evaluation frameworks because embedded in each of those is a um, diversity, equity, and inclusion theme that goes through eliminating opportunity gaps and identifying barriers to learning and, and all of that piece. So the work is continuing. It's just not real systemic, which doesn't feel great, but I still have a lot of confidence in our school staff because they, they know how important this is and they are continuing to do this in whatever ways they can that that fit in with the, the work that they're doing. And I, I also just wanted to close with we had data 
We got to talk about our data. We got to talk about the actions that we're taking in schools. We talked about professional learning. You've had a chance to see school improvement plans. In the future, I think it would be really great if we could come back and mid-year talk to you about what does our mid-year data look like? Um, are we noticing any really big trends that we need to, to respond to and change direction or to really figure out what's going on? And then maybe again at the end of the year to just talk about how it wrapped up. We're also looking at having school improvement plans start to be um, a focus in the spring so that all summer everybody can think about what they're going to be doing for the fall. You're ready to hit the ground running in September and August as opposed to November and December-ish. So those are just kind of some of our, our thoughts about moving forward with this work and their communication with the school board. If Dr. Larson says we can. Thank you both so much for that presentation. For, I was just sitting there like, yeah, I, I loved being able to hear from our building leaders, from our uh, staff and from our teachers. Thank you for all of the information for including the links to RCWs as well and for standards. I think that that's really important to uh, have on hand as well. And thank you so much. I look forward to continue to learn and um, to see how we progress. Thank you. I'd like to move for us to take a short recess. Is five minutes agreeable? Yep. Second. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Back at six. Okay, it is 6.43 p.m. We are moving on to agenda item 6.01. Is there a motion? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves the school resource officer agreement. Is there a second? Second. There is a motion and a second that the Monroe School Board of Directors approves the school resource officer agreement. Discussion. All right. <laughs> Do you want to go? Because I'm going to go. OK. Um, so I, I have this, this item brought up a, a lot of feelings for me, so much so that I was up um, most of last night. And I assure you all that I'm more eloquent at 3 AM <laughs> than I might be right now. Um, but I'm going to try to get through um, everything that I have. So and I've, and I've separated it out. Um, I'm going to start with. I was, I was sort of frustrated by this agenda item because I felt like it was initially put in as something to be green lighted when a, a broader um, board and community conversation is needed. It's, it's really important. Um, and I was also disappointed that there wasn't additional information provided. Um, it's my understanding that this is a, a contract that was voted on by the city council. I'm curious about when that happened and, and why there wasn't any collaboration, why there, why there wasn't a conversation between our board or some board members and, and city council members. That so seems like an opportunity to um, come together. I have a, quite a few questions and I, I don't know if they can be answered um, tonight. It would be great if they can, but I'm, I'll ask them regardless. So I did look up the um, 2020 contract for the SRO, which was through um, the 22-23 school year. The cost of that contract, the one that I read, which, and, and this is another area where I have a question, the, what it looked like to me from the contract was that they were approving just over $73,000 for the 2020-21 school year and that the contract carried over through 21-22 and 22-23, but that each year there was supposed to be a review of the cost. I was not able to find how much was paid in any of those years. Um, so I'm curious about during um, the time of remote learning, 
did we pay $73,000 um, for the SRO contract? I also am curious about the, the current item that we have. So on the, on the action, it says new SRO agreement for 2023-24. But then if you look at the document, the MOU talks about 22-23. It also, which looks like, so if, if we, you know, approve it as is, that looks to me like we're voting on something that part of it has to be, has already been completed. Like we're voting on paying for something, like services that were rendered in November last month. And I'm curious about why we're voting on that now. So I, I don't know if that is just a, a typo um, or if we really are just off in, when this contract is being updated and how it's being voted on. Um, in our action item, it also discusses that there is a cost increase, and that's part of why we're updating this contract. When I added the numbers from the current contract, it came out to $71,000, which is less than the 73 that was from the 2020 contract. So I don't understand that math. Um, Okay, those I think are my questions. The next section that I have is to talk about or express my interest in discussing the need for a school resource officer within the context of a district that needs, um, needs to look at our overall safety plan. I'm also in, in this current contract, it says um, the need for the SRO is, is parallel, the parallel nature of discipline and law enforcement sanctions, right? That's a quote from this contract. I feel like parallel nature of discipline and law enforcement sanctions is, is not in alignment with the presentations that we have received about how students are engaged when they are experiencing difficult behaviors, when they're having trouble in school. I feel like we've received information from um, school and district staff to say that you know, we meet the needs of the students. I also wonder about the accessibility of the Monroe police department and strong partnership that they have with the Monroe School District, that the police station is approximately half of a mile from Park Place Middle School and 1.5 miles to Monroe High School and leaders in learning. When there is that, um, it's clear that there is a strong partnership between the two entities they are near in proximity. And so given our other um, security and safety needs in this district, it is important to me to consider the prioritization of where we're putting resources. And given their, their relational and geographical proximity to the schools that the SRO is functioning in most often. I, there are other things within the district where I would want to see those resources placed. I also think that it is not perfectly aligned with the equitable access that we have as a commitment of the school district. I would be interested in information about the impacts of having a SRO at Park Place Middle School, but not at Hidden River. We also have two schools outside of Monroe Police Department jurisdiction. Another issue that I have with the current, uh, not the contract so much, but the, the action item is that it discusses community input. I think we've repeatedly heard that our community wants transparency and it is unclear to me who and how um, families and students were invited to provide the feedback that, that 
informed this contract and this, this request of the board. We received an email that indicated only three students expressed interest in discussing this contract and only one showed up, that no parents showed up, and that the, the SRO is the one who reported um, feedback that was given by students. Given all of these questions, I would really like to see a task force assigned to assessing the need and purpose as well as the efficacy of SROs in Monroe School District schools. Um, we are also clearly experiencing organizational changes um, within the district and within their safety department. At this time, I believe that our district needs to prioritize and establish its safety and security plan, which may include an SRO, but until a team is in place, can assess the needs and values in collaboration with the school board, I believe that we should maximize available resources for that internal teamwork. We need to recruit and retain quality safety and security staff within the district while maintaining a positive partnership with Monroe Police Department and the Snohomish County Sheriff's Office. Lastly, um, we have had community members come to this boardroom, and I know I have been approached by community board community members um, expressing significant concerns about safety planning, programming, and implementation in our schools. To date, they have not had an opportunity to give additional feedback or ideas, and the board has not received sufficient information, in my opinion, about our um, current state of affairs and planning. As the mom of two kids, and I, I do not like to say this in a public setting um, because it scares me to advertise it, but as the mother of two kids, who attend a school on an unsecured campus, it is imperative to me that we prioritize building safety equitably throughout the district. At this time, I believe the resources put into the SRO would be better spent addressing the urgent needs of developing an internal safety team and addressing gaping holes in security at some of our buildings. I believe all of you have been to Maltby Elementary School. It is not secure. It is a quad campus. There are four buildings. I can enter any one of those four buildings from an exterior door at any point in time. I can do that, you know, uh, like that's not okay with me. That doesn't make me feel that my children are safe at school. It makes me concerned. It makes me feel like we are not setting up our teachers and staff for the incredible um, weight that we put on them to keep our students safe. I am, I am not opposed to having SROs in schools. I'm really not. What I want is for us as a board and organization to prioritize our needs and, and also to acknowledge the change that is happening. Um, and that we're going to have new new voices and new ideas so my ask would be that um, or my vote will be that we not approve this contract and that we revisit sro contracts at a time when we have a safety and security team in place and when safety needs at all schools and for all students has been addressed thank you for bearing with me i appreciate it Director Johnson, it is 6.55 p.m. and you are completely coherent. Good job. Now, I'm gonna, I, ha, I share um, a, a couple of similar concerns with the contract um, in Part G, the financial section. You know, it talks about for services provided in 2022, the city will employ the district at a rate of 86.38.35. That's about 103,000 annually if you did that out over twice 12 months. The next paragraph says that they'll invoice the district for $9,510.82 per month for services provided in January, February, March, April, May of 2023. My question is, there's a lot of numbers of different things, and so my question is, are we paying, thinking of like a certificated employee, is this for an officer who falls on X part of their pay scale? It just, there's, I like to have, since we're getting the bill, I would like to have a little bit better understanding about that, of just what does this agreement look like? 
Um, and so that was actually my question. Um, I've been a high school and middle school teacher at multiple districts, worked with SROs uh, in every instance and some districts where, you know, I had a knife pulled on me on my last day right before we left for Bolivia. That was a wonderful last day of school, you know, student. Wonderful, grateful for the SRO who was there that day. I just said, not today. <laughs> um, but um, I've always had positive experiences for safety issues but also SROs who have done a superb job. And I believe that I have seen this with the Monroe PD, talking with Chief Jolly, we have excellent, excellent um, officers in our, uh, and we have excellent officers, neighbor with a, with a Snohomish County Sheriff Deputy. I, we have a great, we have great deputies as well, but for the Monroe uh, relationship, I think that the relationship that our officers, our SROs in the past have built with students, the training they have done for staff, the training they have done for students as well, and building rapport with students has been um, excellent, especially given a lot of difficult issues that we've had in the last couple of years since I've been on the board. Uh, I think it's imperative. And um, I think that I just want some more clarity on the financials. Um, I think that it would have been nice to have more involvement in, in the same email of, you know, just a few people involved in the feedback. But sometimes I, you know, I'm wondering how much time was given, how broad was that for the advertisement? Those are some of those. Um, but uh, I think that the clarity on the financials is just a helpful thing for me in the details, because that was what I was trying to scratch my head, wondering like, why are these different? And that's, I, that's what I'm assuming. I don't want to assume though in the relationship of that, but those are some of the questions that I had, but I do highly value the relationship that the Monroe School District has had with the Monroe Police Department, with Chief Jolly, with the officers that they've had at different times, different places, and having a dedicated staff member uh, from Monroe PD uh, to be, not just on call, but on site has been very, very helpful in the past as well. Um, and so for me, you know, with security issues uh, happening a lot in our area, in our county, that is something that the safety of our students, and I've said this before, is second to nothing in our district. Their education is a high priority, but you cannot learn in an unsafe environment. And so their safety is absolutely paramount to me. And so for me, this is an important issue. So that's what I want to share. I know that <clears throat> knowing Greg Burns, uh, who's our risk assessment manager or position, uh, he has a complete safety review and analysis of all the buildings. He can tell us every weakness, uh, a breakdown. I've had the discussion with him. Um, I think, I don't know for sure, but I would, <clears throat> excuse me. I would say that that multi elementary would be more of a of a capital improvement bond to get it fixed correctly. Uh, that's just offhand. Um, but Greg would he's going to be leaving. What are you looking at? Yeah, but he could he could do a report beforehand. He can't. <clears throat> well, why is that? Oh. Oh, all right. Well, but check no... that for me. That's a, that's another reason that this is a security thing that we need to continue to maintain the security of our district. So with that position coming up open, that that's something that our district needs to have, and that's a relationship with the SRO that is going to be absolutely vital in that process forever comes in. To replace that. And I would like to add that according to uh, Clause J termination, we do have uh, either, both parties, so that's the district and the city, um, does have authority to terminate the contract in writing um, with 30 days advance notice. So I'm uncomfortable um, knowing that we have two security specialists. Uh, who will be leaving us at the end of this year. And if we don't have a contract in place with an SRO, that leaves us vulnerable, even more vulnerable in our schools. Um, but it does make me feel better to know that there is a clause um, that allows us to terminate the contract if this is something that we need to discuss further, that we have, a, that we have more time to plan with. So uh, that part makes me a little more comfortable. Um, and it sounds like 
uh, we would be responsible for payment for the services rendered uh, and would be able to receive a refund for any prorated services. So at least there's that um, language already in the contract. Uh, but like I said, that lapse in time is uncomfortable for me. I, just to chime in with my opinion, I've had a really good extensive conversation with our SRO about the different areas where um, we are vulnerable as a school district. And I'm, I'm not willing to leave children defenseless in any school or not have an SRO that is on duty to help protect our students. Um, that is first and foremost paramount. We can work out other details. Like President Bumpus said, there is a clause in the contract, but um, I definitely feel a lot better knowing that he is there, especially given the fact that our high school also is an open campus with many ways to get in. And um, I just feel better knowing that he is there. As To your point, Director Johnson, I do believe that it is an area that I would like to explore as well and have a deeper conversation about, though, because I, uh, I agree. I visited all of the schools and definitely some conversations. Yeah, I just, and, and I agree. I also, having that 30-day um, clause in there also makes me feel better, better about the contract. I still, um, I just feel that given the relationship that Monroe School District has with the Monroe PD and hopefully I'm not as aware of because um, every event that I go to in this town the the police department is there right every single event that I have been to every community meeting that I've been to they are always there and so for me I feel that 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 need for safety and that connection that the police officers have with our students is there and that while an SRO can be a good thing, we have other needs in this district that should be addressed first. I'll stop there. Thanks. Can I chime in here? Actually, I'm hearing a number of different things that um, you mentioned that are very important and I think warrant broader discussion and are coming up in some of the work that we have going forward because I'm hearing um, safety, obviously, and needing an update and, and to flesh out our staff there, which we're working on. I'm hearing facilities, and I know that we uh, began a facilities review last spring and it's in draft form, so I would guess we should be getting that final copy here soon. Uh, so I'll follow up on that. Obviously, budget planning, all of this ties into budget, and then it goes back to, Chuck will be so happy to have me mention this, thinking about a strategic plan, because all of this, uh, one has to do with the other and the other. Um, so, obviously, we have a contract expiring at the end of December, you're aware of that. Um, so, let me, I would say, that's what I'm here for. Let me put together some ideas for you for how to move forward with all of these topics um, and how they're related. And um, yeah, and we'll, we'll go from there is what I would suggest. Is it, and this is just a procedural, is it standard to vote on a contract that's already like taking place? You know, with, a, with an SRO contract in my past district we did it, it we looked at it as a continuation the fees changed obviously in this instance i believe that we had some updates to the law as well right. um so it warranted a change but in my experience this is typical okay. um but again 17 years of seeing contracts come through you, you know that's yeah. a little bit different than having it be your first or second time yeah. you know in, in your tenure that's a little bit different. I asked the same question about the fees and the overlaps, and I and Victor can even explain that a little bit. But 
I don't know if it matters for tonight. You want to speak to that real briefly? Oh, uh, it, there's an escalator clause in the contract, and that's the reason for the two months. Uh, just like people get raises during the year, they also got their raises in the police department, and we pay the, it's called an escalator in the contract. And that's the reason for November, December, the raises went into effect, and we're just back paying, so to speak, on their contract that they have with the policemen themselves. So that's the reason for the November, December listing in the contract. So how about if I get back to you with a plan of attack? Sound good? Okay, there's a motion on the table. Uh, I will go ahead and repeat it. Okay, uh, that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves the school resource officer agreement. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? The agenda item has passed four to one. Moving on to agenda item 6.02, resolution number 14-2022, final acceptance of construction completion. Is there a motion? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves resolution 14-2022, final acceptance of construction completion. Is there a second? Second. There is a motion and a second that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves resolution number 14-2022, final acceptance of construction completion. Discussion? I just want to say on this one that I can vouch for how well this facility is used. So last spring, I got to go and have some fantastic corn chowder. Um, I also got to see the Cupcake Wars and vote. And if you go and vote, I would highly encourage you to have some cupcakes in your car because you're going to smell all of those wonderful cupcakes, but you can't eat them because everybody's voting on them. <laughs> so take something <laughs> and take something to curb. Um, lesson learned, but it's definitely worth your time. Um, and while I was there, I did get to learn about the cleanup and care processes that the students have for the kitchen equipment which I need somebody to come to my home and impart that information to family members. So I just wanted to give a, a little bit more context for this. It's a great facility and our staff and students use it really well. Just wanna say I'm a little jealous. I was trying to figure out which board director got to visit. A little jealous you went. <laughs> okay. There is a motion on the table that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves resolution number 14-2022, final acceptance of construction completion. All in favor, raise your hand. The agenda item has passed five to zero. Agenda item 6.03, school improvement plans. Is there a motion? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves the school improvement plans as presented. Is there a second? Second. There is a motion and a second that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approves the school improvement plans. Discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. The agenda item has passed five to zero. Moving on to agenda item 7.08, approval of superintendent consent agenda. Is there a motion? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approve all items as listed and presented in the superintendent consent agenda dated December 12th. 2022. Is there a second? Second. There is a motion and a second that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approve all items as listed and presented in the superintendent consent agenda dated December 12th, 2022. Discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. The agenda item has passed five to zero. On to agenda item 8.02, approval of board consent agenda. Is there a motion? I move that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approve item eight, board consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. There is a motion and a second that the Monroe School District Board of Directors approve all items as listed and presented in the board consent agenda dated December 12, 2022. All in favor, raise your hand. The agenda item has passed five to zero. 
Moving on to agenda item 9.01, board reports or comments. Director Campbell. So speaking of food, Sarah, you missed out on some seriously amazing food at Snow Isle. I'm so sorry you were with us. Um, obviously, you know, four of us were there. Dr. Larson was there. It was very eye-opening for me to see what basically CTE, and I, the best I could describe it, my dad was a teacher, was an instructor at Renton Technical College. It was like what Running Start is for a four-year college type idea. This is what this is. It's like you took a technical college and brought it down to high school. It was legit. I mean, it was, I think impressive is actually an understatement of the level of what they have, the materials that the students are interacting with. I did not feel like I was around high school students. By the way, the salmon was to die for, and I am a salmon snob. So, um, but just to see the way that the students, like the confidence that they had, the relationships that they built, because it's built around common um, passions and callings, vocational callings and things like that. And I know for you, that is your calling and helping people fill that out. And I'm like, Sarah is like going to die that she's not here. But for me, one of the things bringing back, and we kind of ended our conversation this way, and I just want to, I just want to set this right here, put a pin in it for our board to think about in the future. Uh, but looking to the future of this issues with, for example, Sky Valley and um, the conversations of what East County, East Nahomish County needs for uh, training and opportunities for that. And looking at the resources we have as far as property already there, partnerships with what we could do with Snow Isle, partnerships with our relationship with Everett Community College that doesn't have a branch campus. And I worked in a community that did this for Yakima Valley College uh, as well in East Yakima County. And it was the same kind of idea partnerships with the city of Monroe and the Monroe School District and what that would look like bringing that together to do something like a branch campus of Snow Isle that would also be available for um, uh, Everett Community College branch campus type thing, community center, Monroe School District involved in all of these different things and pooling our resources together uh, and what this could be maybe even with involving Sky Valley. These are all things of I don't know what that looks like but it's a gigantic Venn diagram in my head and we're in the middle of it. And um, I would love to see our collaboration and connection with city council, with county, with uh, Snow Isle, with um, EVCC and what, what that could look like in bringing something because it's not just about our own students. This is something that's gonna benefit Gold Bar, Sultan, Index, Skykomish families as well that have these, a lot of these same needs um, and again, our, our priority, our priority is MSD students. But what this does on a grander scale to what, yes, benefit our students and the needs that our students have, the types of courses that they're enrolling in at Snow Isle as well, and looking at what this can do to help not just our students, but our community as well. They're, they're, it just, it, it, it snowballs into all of that. And I would love to see how our district could partner with that. So as far as reaching out with relationships, I really, would really be interested in, in uh, doing that. So even, I know Dr. Larson, this is far beyond your time with us of what that would look like, but any, any cliff notes you can leave, uh, the person that will stand upon your shoulders that we bring in, we would love to have that so that we can start that conversation with that person. So these are just exciting things for us. Sorry. All right. I'll just second what Director Campbell said, that being a Sky Valley parent, having been there now going on five years, um, we desperately need a new building. We need something that can accommodate all of the families who want to use it, and there are many who would come back if we had a new facility, and the partnership excites me, it excites others. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to see what we can do for this and what we can set up. I think it's definitely a priority. This is something that I uh, took away from the WASTA retreat um, or the conference. Uh, and if the board would just indulge me, uh, got a little talk here prepared. This is to the board 
This is to Dr. Larson. So we got a superintendent search going and we're gonna hire the person, pay him about a quarter of a million dollars. And we're gonna say, take the, take the lead, take the reins, educate the kids, go for it. Do we know if their interest is continuing with what we currently have, or perhaps they've done something different, could do things in a different way, bring to the table. Um, how are we going to, how are we gonna give them direction? How will they, we know whether they're going to be following our lead? My, my approach and what I'd like to ask by the end of this, I'll try to make my point, is that we come up with a strategic plan and have it completed by a school year end, to have it come in for the following school year. So I wanna talk about, I have previous experience with this, and I'm gonna talk about why we needed this strategic plan and our fiduciary responsibility for having this plan. Um, in my prior firm, uh, we did a SWOT analysis. We had, our firm had 10,000 policies. We had, as an insurance brokerage, we had 80 employees. We were the largest brokerage in Snohomish, Whatcom, and Skagit County. And we did a SWOT analysis, which is your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Our strengths were we had strong insurance companies. We had major carriers like Safeco, Travelers, Mutual Bean and Cloth. Then we had specialty carriers for contractors, petroleum markets, and that was part of the strengths of our analysis. We also had um, being part of the community. We have had offices in Everett, Monroe, Mill Creek, Granite Falls, Snohomish, Duval, Carnation, Mount Vernon, Oak Harbor, Bellingham, and Anacortes. Another strength we had is we had highly trained staff and personal lines and commercial insurance. We also looked at the weaknesses and threats that we had for our agency. We discussed them and identified them, how to approach them, and take a look at our shortcomings. As a result of the SWOT analysis, we had meetings and developed the plan, but we came down to one statement for our agency, and it was it was this: it's what's right, comma always. That had to do with our integrity. That had to do with with who we were, and hope to hope to continue. So every decision we had came down to uh, talking to an individual or talking to a company, you know, is it the right thing? So why do we need a strategic plan? Well, the school has gone through COVID. Um, the environment and the reality of doing business, going to school has changed. The needs of our students have changed. And the pressure and challenges of the teachers is even greater than it has been in the past. And our families are exposed to different needs and pressures. We need to have a plan to take into account these new changes and things that are happening. And it shouldn't take us 12 months to get this done. With a strategic plan, they say it takes like 12 to 15 months. It can be done at a quicker pace. We can hire a professional to facilitate the planning. And I know that we could even though we have the going ons with uh, getting this new superintendent, I think that will that'll dovetail into a strategic plan where we're developing it as we're looking for the superintendent to lead the school. Um, we will have the criteria to go forward and to make that part of like their job description. We'll be more more familiar with that, and then we can also get their input, um, which we will have selected by that time, the person. Um, and then 
the next part is the purpose of the board. You know, we have a fiduciary responsibility for the operation of the school. Um, we're to follow the, the board standards, financial responsibility for the governance. And right now we don't have a strategic plan. We have the, the three commitments, but um, I talked to Dr. Dr. Larson. We don't have any information on the prior strategic plan. I asked for a, a search. Um, you would think it would be there, uh, but it's not. Um, and it would seem to me that if we hire a superintendent, we have to give them direction. They communicate that direction to the staff, the district staff, and that goes down to the principals and then the teachers. And I know that listening to the reports that we receive, we have a lot of data that is available for making decisions. We have a lot of great ideas I saw with the reports that were that were put forward. Um, so with taking the information that we have, using the data that we have, working together as a board, having a facilitator come in, we can develop a strategic plan and we can get it done by the end of the year. So, you know, I've been harping on this, harping, complaining, kind of all of the above ever since I've been on the board. This, this is my experience on the board. So after a month of getting on the board, the superintendent decides to resign. Then COVID hits and my licensing agency nearly goes out of business. We have shortened hours, we lose employees. I had to figure out how to make payroll so after superintendent puts in her resignation that's when the COVID hits the school the governor decides to shut the entire state down uh, school was in chaos um, we needed to bring in leadership we brought in dr lasco we had to figure out how to educate kids how to get them uh, internet connections for those who couldn't connect we had to figure out how to feed the kids get the bus drivers, get the meal preparers. Um, during this time we had, as I've explained to the board, we've had probably 50 meetings, 50 Zoom meetings. And then we had the period of having the investigation and things being in limbo for six months. And we're, if not in a recession, we're heading in a recession. And so I bring up these points about the the things that have been going on is because we've never had time to make a plan. We've just been responding and we can get a professional to come in. We can take the information that we currently have, the things that we're doing right, build on those. The team can develop a plan that we put together and give the, the new superintendent direction and marching orders then we can hold them accountable based on what we've charged them to do. We can have that as part of their evaluation. Um, so, and the way school works now, so now we don't have a, a meeting for the, the rest of the year. It's like we're already down a month. I have talked to Dr. Larson about this and she is in the process of looking at getting a professional hired. And I know this is, I'm, I'm preempting the board, but this just part of that conversation um, that I think it's important. And that's what I took away from the strategic planning is just our need for one and uh, how it's really a tool that the entire school district can use. And with the, WASTA conference regarding the legislative, the five main categories. Are too much to go into right at this brief amount of time, but I would I could tell you that of the 10 selections that we put towards uh, 
our input towards WASTA. Three of those were actually incorporated uh, career and technical education, ample funding for staffing needs, and supportive school-based health centers. Now, the other ones that come up on this review or the priorities, I look at it as 295 other school districts having interests and needs. And there's smaller school districts, there's a variety of different circumstances. So looking at uh, what the WASDA priorities are, uh, they reflect the priorities for the entire state of Washington of the 295. So they're a bit different, and I'm sure Sarah will have a chance to go into those things. Uh, but that was really the, the basis of it. Uh, some of our priorities got through, some of them didn't, but overall, I think they're good priorities for the state of Washington. That's all. So Chuck, one of the classes that I went to was all about strategic planning. Let me just show you this beauty. This is from the Pasco School District. It's in English and it's in Spanish. And um, the takeaways from the superintendent and one that the board president who were up giving the presentation was incredibly good. It, um, to your point, the district goals, right, our strategic goals should be what your super eval is all about. And I love the fact that they gave the fact that um, they, the SBA, they don't give it in Spanish. So they use star testing, which is actually a dual language test, which I thought was um, just genius. You know, one of those little takeaways is you're always learning. And I, there's just so much that they gave in that time. I've got notes and notes and I'm not gonna give it all now. Um, but another one that I thought was really awesome was the fact that they said, when you have a student advisory council or theirs is called the, stu the Super Student Action Council, they said, when you do something, point back and show where you listen to the students. Acknowledge that point for them so that they can see, hey, we're listening to your feedback, we hear you, and these are the changes that we've made, which I thought was really cool too. Just more involvement and just reminding people that, yeah, we're listening and this is where it's at. And when you have a strategic plan, it's all about making sure that that strategic plan is known by the staff, the families, and the community members and really getting it out there. I mean, they take this and they put this up in every school building so that anybody can look at it at any point in time and refer back to it. So I'm all about strategic plan. We definitely need one, it's overdue. And I'm excited, especially with what I got from that presentation there at the conference. Okay, and my takeaway uh, from the WASDA conference was actually, uh, to your point, Molly, it's a uh, focus on student voice. And so that's kind of where my commitment is at after returning from that. And I was excited to see that we had student input on the superintendent search um, information and I, uh, it always fills my bucket to go and visit school. So that's what I plan on hopefully reaching out and bringing with me my, yeah, yeah, the school information. So we can just go ahead and check off the information as we go through the walk. Um, and I did go to a really neat one that I, was excited about it was an onboarding and it was introduction to the commitment to educational equity um, and it was uh, what is it Bethel school district and so we were able to run through an exercise with the uh, person they, they had come in and do some of that work and I just thought it was a really neat exercise they had you write down like five characteristics or five things that define you and you got to hold them up with a partner and then they took one of them and you know, they couldn't see which one they took and they tore it up in front of you and like they had to like smush it throw it tear it up just to see if like that's how that felt to have someone just attack some piece of you and that's so important to you i thought that was really powerful i accidentally ripped up someone's who said like his family and kids and i was like i'm so sorry so sorry um 
Yeah, and I just want to say how grateful I am to be a part of the Monroe School District, part of this community. Um, I, I just like love, I mean, obviously, I love our building leaders, our staff, and our teachers, and I'm just so grateful to be here. And, uh, and I'm grateful that we have such an incredible board as well, because uh, we have grown a lot. We've been through some, some battles together. We've, uh, and, and I'm just grateful to serve alongside you for. So thank you for pulling through. And, um, and I, I'm also grateful that we're such a diverse board and we don't always agree on the things, but we do the things. And so thank you to all of you um, for making this a place where I think we all just want to serve and we want to see Monroe do the Monroe things. Okay, and it is 7.32 p.m. and tonight's meeting is adjourned.